the mandate hasn't changed. The mission hasn't changed to honor Christ as head and to go and make disciples. And that's the responsibility of the church. The Word of God works in the church both to form us, to shape us. I mean, the, the scriptures create the church in that sense. Wherever the Word of God goes, you see when the power of the Spirit accompanies it, churches come up. People get converted and they're united to churches. And that church then has a responsibility to be a steward. So when a church loses sight of its authority, its marching orders, of the place from which it is to take its, its bearings and its uh, uh, directives, and begins to drift and think, well, hey, this is more effective than what we have been doing, or here's something new that we ought to try because the, we live in a new day than our parents did, and they are not measuring everything by scripture, they get off track and they wind up maybe doing a lot of things that look really cool, but in reality, as Jesus said, you have a reputation to be alive, but in fact, you are dead. God has spoken and Christ is head of the church. So the church isn't a democracy. The church is a Christocracy. We have a head. We have one who is the final authority. He has spoken. So everything a church is to be and everything a church is to do needs to be grounded in what God has once for all said in the scriptures. So the task of the church is to understand the scriptures and to apply it in a way that forms the body itself, all of the members who come in being rightly related to Christ and faith in Him, and therefore related to one another in this, what we call a covenant commitment to each other. So we actually say that we belong to one another, we belong to the church, so that we can represent Christ in the world. I mean, the, the church is the repository of God's truth. Nobody else has been tasked with making the gospel of Jesus Christ known. It's not the school's job, it's not the uh, uh, public services job, it's not any social services job, it is the church's job. If the church fails at this, then we don't have any other hope. There's no plan B for getting the gospel to the ends of the world. One of the things we've seen, especially in these last many, many years in uh, Western civilization in America, is the, the state getting out of its lane and the church giving up its lane. Uh, we need to recognize again, no, we have a word to say here for God. We're speaking for God. We're not trying to make the state the church, but we are trying to say that the state exists because of the same God who created the church and who created the family. So our responsibility is to teach. Our responsibility is to make God's truth known. And we, we are to do that in every sphere. And again, I, I think we, uh, we've lived off the largesse of God's kindness to us out of the, the first great awakening where there was, was this wonderful impulse of the gospel running throughout the colonies here in North America. And then from that springing up this uh, new movement of a new republic that has a constitution that is our highest authority that is significantly informed by a biblical worldview. And we've been blessed by that in this nation since its founding with all of our blemishes, with all of our shortcomings, that we've presumed upon it and we have lost sight of the fact that the reason we enjoy the blessings and the benefits and the freedoms we do is because there was this biblically informed understanding of what the state is and how the state is to function and how it's not to function and how government is to be limited and is not to uh, become what it has increasingly become in our day, a nanny state where the government's expected to do everything. It's almost like the government is treated like a god that you appeal to whenever you have any problems and that uh, you demand to do things for you when you think uh, justice is not coming the way you believe it ought to come. Well, that's the church's fault. And so I, I, I think what's going on in our society today is a very clear indictment on the church. And the church of Jesus Christ needs to repent. I mean, it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And what is that judgment? The judgment is we have neglected the word of God. We've not lived like the church. When the church loses sight of its mission, its identity, and it 
forgets its marching orders from Scripture, it fails the family, it fails the world, it fails the state, it fails its fellow citizens. There's nothing a church can do that is more loving to neighbors than to be the church. In 2020, we got a very dramatic display of how far removed American Christianity is in our thinking about the church from Scripture. Uh, it was a commentary on how desperately we need to recover a biblical doctrine of church. So we had evangelical leaders not knowing what to do, and I get it, in the, the early days of the uh, COVID pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty, you know, is this gonna kill everybody? And so people did listen to our magistrates, our civil authorities, and we pulled back. But after a few weeks, it became increasingly apparent that even some of our civil magistrates were telling us to do one thing while they were doing something else. And the rules began to change and uh, there began to be less clarity in what they were saying. And there were questions that began to emerge. And when you had civil magistrates saying churches don't have to meet, and too many evangelical leaders immediately went along with it. So, well, that's true. We can just have church online or uh, meeting is not that important. Though the word church is ekklesia in the Greek New Testament, and it means assembly together. You know, assembly is one of the least important things we do. I read that so many times I, I got uh, ill over just seeing how many Christians would actually think that. And then you see evangelical leaders saying, oh, you can do church online, love your neighbors, stay home, do church online, even giving instructions on how you could, quote, do the Lord's Supper online. Get a bottle of juice, any juice will do, get some crackers, follow me. I'm thinking, have we lost our minds? Has somebody stolen our Bibles? Is not, do we no longer know what the Word of God actually says? So we desperately need to recover a biblical understanding of what the church is. I saw the first study, I believe it was in May or June of that year, a few months into this pandemic and riots are beginning because of other social unrest in the nation. And the first study I saw said that up to 30% of American Christians who were active in church at the beginning of the year before the pandemic had no intention of going back to church. I've now seen three or four of those studies and they're saying uh, up to 40% have no intention of going back. Well, why should they? They've been discipled for the last year saying, you can stay home, you can go to church online. Well, if I can go to church online, can I go to church in my pajamas? Do I have to go to church at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning? Can I do it Monday morning at seven o'clock? Well, what if I wanna go to the beach and take my computer there and go to church in the beach? We've been telling people that, certain evangelical leaders have been telling Christians that for months and months and months. Don't be surprised when they start believing it. What I want to say to my brothers and sisters is we need to go back to the Word of God. Stop your ears to all these folks who are telling you how you can do church differently and look at the Scripture. See what God's Word says and what you'll find there is that Jesus Christ intends for His people to follow Him together, to live together. I mean, can you imagine where we would be today if earlier generations of Christians, because it was dangerous, quit going to church, quit assembling together. And they said, well, we just must love our neighbors and we must take care, so we're going to stay home until everything is safe. Really? We wouldn't have a heritage of godliness handed down to us. What are we gonna hand down to our children and our children's children if we live in fear and cave into those who think that they can come up with new ways that are contrary to, that the Bible knows nothing about, and telling us this is how we can do church. One of the most significant things that's needed in our day is to go back to the scripture, open the Bible, and begin to read and see what it says a church is and how a church is to function. A local church that's functioning as it ought to function is an outpost of heaven. It becomes uh, an opportunity to show the world 
what is true about the God who created the world, who sent his son into the world to save sinners. It's been rightly said that through preaching, the gospel is made understandable. And through the church, the gospel is made visible. It's put on display so that the message of reconciliation is shown by how we live reconciled lives. The message of God's great love for sinners is displayed in how we love one another. Uh, the message of forgiveness is put on display in how we forgive each other. So the church of Jesus Christ is not an afterthought. And local churches should not be treated as incidental to the Christian life. It is as we live together in a body of believers committed to Christ and committed to one another that we're able to follow him as he calls us to follow him. Because every local church is ultimately a Christocracy. It's not a democracy. It's not an oligarchy. Christ is the head of every local church and his authority is mediated in the church. I like to think of it as a relationship of a ship to the ocean. A ship is designed to be in the ocean and doesn't function well unless it's in the ocean doing what ships are designed to do. And when a ship's in the ocean, then man, it can perform to its fullest extent. But when the ocean gets into the ship, you got real problems. You don't want the ocean, you don't want the ocean coming in and dictating to the ship how the ship is going to go or it'll sink the ship. Neither do you want the ship dry docked so that we just admire it, but it's never out there doing what it's designed to do. The church needs to be in the world for the world, not being shaped by the world, not taking worldly ideas and worldly cues to determine its mission. We have a very clearly defined mission. Lord Jesus has told us what we are to do in this world. And it's only as we take seriously our calling to, to live together under his lordship that we're able to fulfill that mission. Nobody else in the world has been given the responsibility to go and make disciples. It's not the school system's job. It's not any business's job. It's not any parachurch ministry's job. It's the job of the church of Jesus Christ. And every local church owns that responsibility. Every local church must see itself as the pillar and the ground of the truth. What that means? is that every local church is the repository of the truth. We have been entrusted with truth and we're stewards of it and we must make it known locally, sending it throughout the world by sending workers to go to hard places with the word to preach Christ, to make disciples and see those disciples formed into healthy churches. Where someone is trying to follow Jesus and not living this way, they are missing what Jesus has called us to be as his disciples. We are to follow him together in the local church. One of the things that has been missing in American society for too long is the presence of healthy churches. Because not everything that goes by the name of church today is indeed a, a church of Christ. Jesus himself said that there are some places that are synagogues of Satan, where people say, oh, no, no, we're the people of God. And he says, no, you're really a synagogue of Satan. So what characterizes a true church? What are the marks? Well, out of the Reformation, there were three of them. And the, the first is the faithful preaching of the word. Again, because of the priority of the word, the word shapes our understanding of the church because the word creates the church. And it's only as that word is rightly understood and taught and applied in the power of the Spirit that you have the church emerge and you have the church discipled, you have the church formed more and more into the reflection of Jesus Christ in the world. And then secondly, it is the, the right uh, understanding and practice of the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, because in baptism, we have this uh, one-time event that displays that we have died to sin and we've been raised with Christ and we are now washed of our sins because of Jesus Christ and we are united to Him. Our lives are hidden in Christ. And then the Lord's Supper, which is that regular ongoing ordinance where we eat and drink as a testimony that we live by Christ. 
our faith in Christ is what sustains our lives. And so we are regularly reminded of his death. Paul says, you know, that, that this is how we proclaim the Lord's death till he returns, by eating and drinking the Lord's Supper. This is a church ordinance. And where the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are practiced rightly, where they're understood and, and they're regularly practiced according to the word, that's a characteristic of the church. So if you're looking for a church, you, you need to find a true church, not just somebody that says, hey, this is a church, look at the sign. It tells us here's a First Baptist Church. Well, that may be the Church of Christ, may not be. Do they preach the word as the word accurately? Do they practice the ordinances with a sense that we are enacting the truth from the word? And then the third thing, and this is really the, the missing uh, mark of the church in our day, woefully so, is the, the right practice of church discipline. Are God's people being formed by that word that's being proclaimed, that's being enacted in the ordinances? Is the word shaping them? Discipline tends to be a bad word in our day, and, and that's tragic because discipline is at the very core of being a disciple. It is being shaped, it's being taught, it's being trained, and, and there's formation that takes place. So the, the primary aspect of being disciplined into conformity with Jesus is having the Word and the power of the Spirit teach you so you change your mind and you become less conformed to the world and its patterns of thinking and more transformed by the renewing of your own mind as that word washes over you and changes your perspective and strengthens you inwardly and it changes your affections and gives you the ability to live in accordance with what Christ has revealed. And as that formative discipline takes place, there will be less and less need for the corrective discipline to take place, at least in extreme ways. So the second time Jesus uses this word, church, is in Matthew 18 and he does it in the context of a local assembly, no longer talking about all the people who will ever be uh, drawn to him by the power of the Spirit and believe in the gospel. Jesus knows that uh, we can get bullheaded and sin is really sinister and the devil hates us and the world entices us. And so sometimes we can get really tripped up and we can go astray. And, and when a brother comes and tries to restore us, we might just write him off or dismiss him, laugh him off and say, you know, who are you to tell me how I should live? And what do we do? Do we just wash our hands of one another? No, no. Jesus says in Matthew 18 that you get one or two others and go with you so that in the, the uh, evidence or the, the presence of two or three witnesses, these things can be confirmed. And if he hears the two or three of you, then praise God, your brother's one, it's over, you rejoice at God's kindness, nobody else has to know about it. And Jesus says, however, so if he doesn't hear the two or three of you, then you're to tell it to the church. The church, what is that? That is this body of believers that you are united to as followers of Christ because you're following him together. And he said, even if that happens, if they refuse to hear even the church, then that person has become to you like uh, a tax collector, uh, like uh, uh, someone who's a, an outsider, Pharisee, somebody that no longer can be considered a part of the church. Well, you can't read Matthew 18, 15 through 18 accurately without recognizing that the Christian life is <clears throat> a community effort. It is something that involves more than just you and Jesus. The Christian life is to be lived in the community of a local church. And that local church needs to preach the word, they need to practice the sacraments of the word, and they need to be willing to discipline one another so that together Christians in that body are being grown up together into the full uh, conformity to Christ until we attain complete maturity on that occasion when we see him face to face. Christ is Lord of the church. He's the head of every local church. And the scripture says in Ephesians 4 that he gives gifts to the church. And part of the gifts that he gives are those men that would be set aside to serve in the capacity of elders. Again, out of the Protestant 
Reformation and especially in Baptist life, but not exclusively, we have recognized two offices in the New Testament church, that of elder, pastor, um, bishop, and that of deacon. And so the elder, pastor, bishop, or overseer is one office. It's used, it's the, all three of those words are used in Acts 20, 1 Peter 5, and Titus 1 to describe that one office. But then you have the office of deacon, which just means servant. And where a church has both offices properly established by godly men who are qualified and equipped, gifted to fulfill their functions, man, you have a great blessing. You have a great blessing because the, the deacons, they're not exercising authority and lordship over a church. That's a job for Christ himself, but Christ as Lord of the church commissions elders to give oversight to a church. And I know some churches don't have elders and deacons kind of function in that, that quasi capacity. And I would, again, just say, go back to the Bible and use Bible words for those categories. And I think what you'll see is that yes, our forefathers were right. There are two offices, the office of elder, pastor, overseer, and the office of deacon. And where the office of the elder, pastor, overseer is rightly understood, it will be recognized that Christ vests authority in those elders. Those elders are gonna give an account, Hebrews 13, 17 says. One day they're gonna stand and give an account. Paul uh, makes this very plain too in his commission to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 when he tells him to preach the word in the presence of God, the Jesus Christ before whom you will appear on the day of judgment. I mean, he just loads up this sense of one day you're gonna give an account for everything I'm telling you, preach the word. Well, there's an accountability built into the responsibility that Timothy has to lead that church in Ephesus. In Acts 20, when Paul's speaking to the Ephesian elders, men he probably himself appointed to that office during his time in Ephesus, he tells them that they are to shepherd the flock of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I mean, he uses that, that very stark language, I think, to arrest them, that these people, the sheep, in this congregation that we're responsible to shepherd have been purchased by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're gonna give an account for them. And where that is understood by the pastors, the elders, they're not gonna be heavy handed. Peter warns against that, you know, not with uh, any kind of authoritarian abuse, First Peter 5, but rather with gentleness, with a willingness, with a determination to exercise authority well not trying to micromanage everything about the church members' lives, that's not their responsibility, but to see them built up in holiness, in faith, in love, to see them become more and more like Christ, to feed them God's word and to help nurture them and guide them by that word. Man, where a church has godly elders and godly deacons, uh, the, the members of that church are blessed because you have deacons who are the lead servants in the church and they fulfill responsibilities necessary to help the elders do their job well, to help the church function well, uh, both in relationships within the church and in relationships to the community and the world. So where those offices are sustained by godly men who meet the qualifications that are set forth in uh, 1 Timothy and in Titus, a church member is blessed. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a church like that? If you love Jesus, then go where Jesus is loved enough to have these two offices sustained and you've got godly elders who take seriously their responsibility knowing the day is going to come when they'll give an account for how they shepherd your soul and learn what it means to be submissive to Christ by following the leadership and being submissive to those godly elders in, in appropriate, right ways. And then go alongside those lead servant deacons and serve with them. Learn what it means to serve. Learn how you become a better, more faithful, more giving type of servant in the household of Jesus Christ. That is part of the way that God shapes his people into greater conformity to his son. So I would say to every Christian, again, find a healthy church, build your life around it. Look for godly leadership, find out how those uh, spiritual leaders in the congregation see themselves. How do they understand the word? How do they handle the word? How do they respond when they themselves sin? How do they repent? And how do they forgive when they are sinned against? Because they shepherd the flock of God and they themselves are a part of that flock and they themselves have to uh, learn what it means to be shepherded by one another 
uh, where that is taking place in a local congregation, the church is blessed, families are blessed, the community is blessed because it is a church putting on display the power and the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I would say to every Christian, if you're really serious about Jesus, you need to get involved in, submit yourself to a true church. Find the healthiest church you can find and build your life around it. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you're not doing that, if a church is just kind of an afterthought to you and maybe you attend church, you go to the services, you listen to sermons, or uh, you might uh, read all kinds of books and study theology and memorize scripture, but if your life is not pledged to Jesus Christ in a local church, then there's something not healthy, something's very, very wrong. There may be extenuating circumstances. You might be in the military off to war. You might be in prison. You might be uh, homebound. There might be extenuating circumstances, but those are the exceptions that prove, prove the rule. So under normal circumstances, every sincere, faithful, growing disciple of Jesus needs to be involved in a body of believers that's being shepherded together into greater conformity to Christ. And if you're not doing that, I would just call on you to repent. So any Christian that really wants to love his neighbor needs to find a healthy church and submit to Christ in that church and work to make that church as biblical, as holy, as joyful, as energetic and fulfilling its mission as possible. The church has that responsibility. If we, if we fumble that, nobody else is gonna pick up that ball. This is the church's job. We must do it because Christ has commissioned us to do it.